Good morning. This being the Silicon Valley campfire dedicated to software architecture, in this talk, we will discuss how a software architect thinks about an application as opposed to how a programmer thinks about implementing that application. Essentially, for most folks here, we're going to discuss what you don't know you don't know in terms of application development. Uh, my background, uh, my name is Ron Kleinman. I've been an instructor at De Anza College for over 30 years. I've started uh, during that time many courses, um, one of which makes me sound like a doctor. Uh, I gave the first C-section uh, at De Anza. Um, in this particular case, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be analyzing a complex software application from the point of view of the software architect. So to understand what a software architect does, let's look at what an architect does, the kind of things that they do in architecting a house. Um, you start with the home buyer's functional specification. Uh, in this particular case, the buyer says, I want this, a three bedroom, two bath home, 2000 square feet, uh, large living room, and all of the requirements that the buyer is interested in in that house, about the master bedroom suite, solar heating, security system. You're a building architect. You must build that house. Where do you start? Where do you begin? You've got the specification. Where do you start? That's not where you start. Obviously, there's some thinking that needs to be done between the point that you hear the specification and the point that you say to the carpenters and the electricians and the masons, this is what you do to build that house. So what does a building architect actually do when starting construction or design of a new building? So you have the roles you've got. There's a, a customer planning documents, physical system decisions, and the actual installation. And for a new home, they break down into the buyer, who is the one that comes up with the functional specifications for the house, the architect, who takes those specifications and creates a series of blueprints that are used to convey the thinking of the buyer to the people who are going to be actually building the house. Uh, the general contractor makes decisions like, looks at the blueprints and says, oh, what kind of piping are we going to use? What kind of wire are we going to use? Uh, actually makes the, the specifications real, the specific house. And then finally, the workers are brought in the plumbers and the electricians working under the general contractor to implement the blueprints that the architect defined based on the customer's input. And that's how houses get built. So you have, you're an architect and you've got the functional specification as we've discussed. You have to build that house. What is the first thing that you do? What is the first thing that you do? Well, you need to identify the actual components. The functional specification usually is from the point of view of the customer, not the implementer. And your job as the architect is to translate that set of instructions from the customer into something that the implementers can build. Start by asking questions. In the example that we gave, there was a specification for a house. The architect looks and says, shouldn't the house have a kitchen? What about closet space, a laundry room? Those are things that every house needs to have. Wasn't in the functional specification that the customer wrote uh, and has to be added in because otherwise the house can't be built. You need to look at the interactions between components. What are the sizes of the bedrooms? Where are they located? What about the high level requirements? Uh, security is a word that's used both for building houses uh, and for building applications. But what kind of security? In the case of a house, um, it could be anything from uh, an electronic uh, uh, photo uh, system that scans the doorway to in a more, in a less safe neighborhood, uh, bars on the windows. Um, there has to be capacity, things that the general contractor would get involved with. Uh, the capacity of the water heater, the piping, uh, and the zoning, there are zoning requirements. It must fit in with existing structures in the same way that an application 
must fit in with the other applications running in the corporate enterprise. What are the trade-offs? Some applications require more money. Others um, require it has to be done uh, by a certain date. And then each individual component has to be analyzed. Um, what is the exact size? What is the material? Uh, information that the implementers are going to need in order to construct that house. So what does a software architect actually do when starting to develop a new software application? And it turns out it parallels what the architect did with the house. The, the application, the buyer becomes the domain expert. If you're designing a system to automate a library, it's the librarian. If you're designing a system to uh, handle enrollment at a, at a college, uh, it's the registrar. Uh, and they have a set of functional specs, the things that the application needs to do. The software architect takes that functional spec and generates, instead of blueprints, generates a series of UML artifacts. That's unified media language artifacts, which convey the thinking of the domain expert in a way that the developers can actually implement what the vision of the domain expert is. Um, you have a uh, typically on a project, there's uh, either the software architect or the main project designer worries about issues that transcend the particular application. Issues like data store. Are we going to have it in a, in a central IT facility or are we going to put the application in the cloud? What about security? What security schemes are we going to use? And these are transcend the particular application, but they involve, they're like the zoning requirements. They're the things that you have to do because you live in a certain neighborhood. And finally, uh, we have the, the developer, the software programmer, who comes in to code and debug that particular uh, pieces of the application, call them objects, that have been defined. And so taking it together, you have a house. So let's look at an example of an application and see what the thinking is that takes it from the functional specification and starts it on the road toward an application. So here is the description of a college enrollment system. Um, and it's particularly tied to De Anza, which is the college that I teach at. Um, De Anza courses are offered by departments, available quarterly, there's an identification number and it has a name like object-oriented analysis and design, uh, description, number of credits, things about the course that's being offered. Each course is assigned a set of times when it meets, assigned a teacher who is willing and able to, to teach that course. And I'm reading this because this is the functional description of the application that we're going to be looking at. It's assigned a room, students may enroll, uh, uh, sections can be open, waitlisted, or full. Um, if a student is accepted, her attendance will be tracked and she will receive a final grade. You take this description and the question is, you must produce a working system. Where do you begin? And you don't start with the code in the same way that you didn't start building the house based on the functional description. You don't start coding based on the functional description. You have an architect who starts looking at it and moving the process forward. The first step that the architect does, software architect, identify all the components, ask questions, take the functional specification and try to make it into something that you can implement. This involves direct talking to the domain expert to identify and document the issues that are going to be relevant to that application. So the first thing that you do is you need to define the words. Words have meaning. And the first step toward implementing an application is defining the application vocabulary. What do the words mean in the context of this application? So we highlight the words. Um, we look and we say, there's college, that's an important thing for an enrollment system. Courses that are taken, departments, teachers, rooms, and students. 
those are going to be the basic abstractions that underlie what the application is go going to do. And so we have six basic abstractions that we would be making into objects in an object-oriented solution for the enrollment application. Then we start asking questions. And it should be noted that a software architect can come in in the morning and stare at the ceiling and go out to lunch, come back, stare at the ceiling, go home, full day's work. Question is, what is a software architect thinking about? Here are some of those things. Can you assign a room and a teacher to a course? Well, the thing is, a course might be taught in several rooms. It might be taught by several teachers. So which teacher or room is assigned to teaching that course? Can a student enroll in a course? Well, sure, but it's being taught in several rooms with several teachers. So what is a student actually enrolling in? And you realize there's an abstraction missing here. It's not we've been talking about enrolling in courses, teaching courses, but course doesn't have that meaning in the application that we're defining. There's a new abstraction here, something else that's hiding in the details of the application that the software architect needs to identify. And it's a section. A course has many sections of a course. Each section has a room, has a teacher, and has students. Essentially, a section instantiates a course. A course might be taught uh, in the winter, and there, in, in a given term, there might be no sections of that course being taught at all, which means no one enrolls, no one teaches it. Or you could have one section, or you could have multiple sections. And so when you're saying, I'm enrolled in a course, what you're really saying is, I'm enrolled in a section of a course. And that is changing the vocabulary of the application, but it's also getting it to be something that can actually be implemented and solved by an application. Second question, um, teachers, rooms, and students all must detect scheduling conflicts. Student can't take two sections at the same time, teacher can't teach it, room can't hold it. How do we avoid writing duplicate code? Because we've got the same scheduling issue. Does this section match my, my uh, schedule? So we have to write schedule conflict detection code that, that says you can't do this because it conflicts with this other section. How do we do that? Well, we have three choices. We can write the scheduling conflict code once and cut and paste it into the other two places that we need it. We can write a new object containing the code or we can write a new object containing the code which is used by all three applications. And in this particular case, it makes the most sense to have every object contain its own schedule object. So the schedule object doesn't even apply necessarily to the enrollment application. This is, this is an application that knows how to merge two schedules, how to subtract out one schedule from another if the course is dropped knows how to do all of that without knowing that much about our application. One of the things that a software architect uses to his or her advantage is when you're faced with a problem that you have to deal with in an application, one good approach is to wall it off behind an object encapsulation and assign someone else to worry about it so that no one else has to think about how to solve that particular application. So we started with these six abstractions or objects. And we've added two more. We've added schedule. We've added section. Now we go to lunch. Now comes the afternoon. We start thinking, what is a prerequisite? A prerequisite is something that you have to complete before you can enroll in a section, actually in a, in a section of a course. So you can't take uh, CIS 2 perhaps before you've taken CIS 1. And we're trying to define what that is. Is it a course, a section? Is it a string containing the name of the course? Is it a different object entirely? We're an architect. Before the programmer gets there, we have to understand the meaning 
of the word prerequisite. Otherwise, it's impossible to implement. And we have to do that in a way that matches the expectation of the domain expert. So we think about it. For, suppose we say it's a course. Well, okay. Three recs have departments and, and course identifications. You must uh, take CIS 1 before you take CIS 2. Course can have multiple prerequisites. You have to take English whatever and math whatever and CIS before you can take CIS 2. Uh, a prereq can have multiple prereqs. If, if you have CIS 1 might depend on some things. So those will be the reasons for making prereq into a course. There's no reason for making it into a section. Uh, prereq is always focused on was the material covered. A simple string. Well, you say, okay, CIS 1. It only has to be a simple string inside of CIS 2 or a new type of object. So let's think about it some more. Look at the catalog of a typical college. Prereqs have types. They're advisory or they're mandatory. Um, they may be totally independent of, of other courses. An example would be for CIS2, prior experience with the object-oriented language. That's not a course prerequisite. It's just a prerequisite for a course. So we start thinking that, oh, prerequisites are objects. They, have, they may have a, a type, advisory or mandatory. They may be a combination of multiple courses. They may have a string. This is the kind of object a prereq is. Let's wall it off behind uh, object encapsulation and give it to a developer to do. Um, but we now understand how prereqs impact the application that we're doing. This is the thinking that goes into making that specification and actually making something that can be implemented by developers. So we've gotten this far. And this is where we are at this point in time. Um, what we're looking at is a UML artifact. The artifact shows in terms of what we've designed so far that we have a college which has departments. One college has N departments. A department offers N courses. Uh, a course has prerequisites. Um, the department employs teachers who have schedules. That's the red S. It owns rooms, uh, in, in, in particular in Dianza. Um, it, it, the room, particular room is owned by the department, not the college. Um, and then we have sections. A room, one room locates N sections, one teacher instructs N sections. At this point, you could show this diagram to two people. You could show it to the registrar and say, is this what the enrollment system is dealing with? And the registrar would say, yes, this is a very different uh, uh, diagram than would have come from the original functional description. It's much more intuitive in terms of what is actually going on with the application. And it is also something that a developer could look at. The developer looks at this and says, Okay, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight objects that have to be implemented. I sort of have an understanding of how they relate. I have a beginning idea about how this application should be implemented. At this point, we're going to stop, uh, let some other speakers go, and we'll come back and take this to the next level. Thank you very much for your time.